Emily Mitchell from Cambridge University. So Emily is um, currently doing a, a NERC fellowship in Cambridge in the zoology department, but she actually has an imperial history. She was an undergraduate at Imperial, um, she says, a long while ago. I don't know exactly when. Uh, and she was originally a physicist. Um, she did an undergraduate in undergraduate degree in physics here and then a master's in, well, let's call it something quantum. Um, <laughs> but after that, she discovered real science. Um, and has moved into paleontology, did a PhD at, the, at um, Cambridge with Nick Butterfield on the Ediacaran fauna and is now continuing to work on these amazing late Precambrian fossils and is here to give us a talk on the way in which we can apply modern ecological methods and all sorts of clever methods, in fact, to get a better understanding of the communities uh, at the end of the Paleozoic, pre Paleozoic the end of the Precambrian and some of, um, some of these weird creatures that we find. So. Uh, Emily, if I can pass over to you. What thank you, Mark. <laughs> it's really lovely to be here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. So I work at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Zoology now, trying to understand the origins and evolution of early animals. So the first animals are found in the fossil record during the Ediacaran time period, around 580 million years ago. Prior to the Ediacaran, life was microbial and after the Ediacaran is a Cambrian explosion where we see all modern animals first appear in the fossil record. And it was during the Ediacaran that we see some of the most important innovations for animals first appear. Most notably is large body size and the first animals, but we also get the first evidence of mobility, the first bilaterians, the first bimineralizers, so that's reef builders, and the first evidence of predation. So the macro, macro fossils of the Ediacaran form three main assemblages, the Avalon, the White Sea and the Nama. For the most part, they cover different time periods and environments. The oldest, the Avalon, has fossils found exclusively in a deep water setting, about a kilometre deep, and consists of fossil localities mainly from Newfoundland, Canada and Charnwood Forest here in the UK and Leicestershire. The White Sea assemblage is shallow water, found mainly in Australia and Russia, while the Nama assemblage is found mostly in Namibia. So most of my work to date has focused on the Avalon. So I'll be talking mostly about these fossils, but also towards the end talking more about uh, later on fossils. So the first ever fossil found in rocks known to be Precambrian was this Charnia, which was found here in the UK by school children in the 1950s. So this fossil is incredibly important because it demonstrated that life existed prior to the Cambrian. The fossil record prior to Charnia's discovery was something that really worried Darwin. He saw that the sudden appearance of fossils in Cambrian rocks, things like trilobites. However, if his ideas of natural selection were correct, then animal life shouldn't just suddenly appear, it should have a gradual buildup. And these Ediacaran fossils do exactly that. So most of the Ediacaran organisms at, uh, belong to a clade uh, called Rangimorphs, like this Charnia. Now these Rangimorphs exhibit fractal style branching. That is, they have branches, which have branches, which have branches, sometimes down to five different orders of branching level. But these are very, very problematic because while they look superficially like plants, because they're found in very deep water rocks, we know they can't have been photosynthetic. Their unique um, anatomies aren't found anywhere else in the fossil record or alive today. So it's still not very clear what they were. In fact, they're so problematic, pretty much every group has been suggested seaweeds, microbial colonies, giant protists, lichen, fungi, and even a now extinct kingdom. The idea was that life got big and complex, but ultimately failed and died out, paving the way for animals to rise in the Cambrian. But now we know these ideas are not correct. So analyses by Frankie Dunn at Oxford looked into how these Ediacaran fossils grew. And by comparing the different modes of growth um, to different groups of different organisms such as fungi and plants, she determined they couldn't be algal because their growth zones are very different um, and they couldn't be fungi either. Therefore, she placed them very broadly within the eumetazoans. Uh, but so far, it's not been possible to place, place them more precisely. So younger fossils such as this Dickinsonia uh, from the White Sea assemblage has been used to, um, well, because it's been really exceptionally preserved with organic molecules, we've been able to use biomarkers in order to ascertain that this too was broadly a metazoan and wasn't something like a sponge or, or, or something different. So we know that Ediacaran 
organisms are indeed the first animals to have existed. But because these Ediacaran fossils lack clear analogues with anything alive today or elsewhere in the fossil record, there's a lot of uncertainty about what, um, and fundamental questions that remain. So what are Ediacaran organisms? Uh, why did life become large when it did? And what were the drivers of early animal evolution? So I'm going to be talking to you today about how my work has addressed various aspects of these questions. So given that we don't have any clear analogues with anything else, uh, fossil or alive today, how can we go about investigating Ediacaran organisms? Well, fortunately, the fossil preservation is exceptional. Entire communities of thousands of mobile organisms were pre preserved under volcanic ash flows. So rather like Pompeii, everything was captured where it was living, creating multiple censuses of Ediacaran life. So here we've got Mis Mistaken Point in Newfoundland, which is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of its importance to understanding the evolution of life on Earth. And these are the D and E surface, which we'll be hearing a lot about. And each one of these has literally thousands of fossils preserved on them. And here we can see some of them here. You can see the volcanic ash that uh, killed them. And where the ash has eroded away, you can see the fossils. And so you get these fronds that have these holdfast disks and stems, and then the, the rangimorph type branching features here. Um, and, and what this means, this exceptional preservation, is that if we can map out these communities, we have an exceptional data set available to us. So how do we go about creating maps? Now, this is non-trivial. You, you often see in, in talks these wonderful fieldwork photos with bright blue skies. But Newfoundland, as anyone who has been there will know, is often incredibly foggy and incredibly miserable, um, in terms of the weather, at least. Um, this means that photography is hard. The fossils are low relief. And while when the light is good, they look absolutely amazing. Most of the time, <laughs> it's very hard to make out any features. In fact, the worst field season I had, we only had this really perfect light for two half hour slots. Um, this really limits how useful photography can be in capturing these fossils. So over the last six years, I've been using a new approach to mapping out these communities. Me and my field team use a combination of LIDAR to capture the large scale bedding plane uh, features and a, a handheld laser line probe. So this, um, this laser here is normally used for aerospace and manufacturing, but rather unusually, I've taken it out into the field to map out these communities. So you can see here, you hold the laser and it's attached by a mechanical arm to a tripod and you pass the laser over the fossils. Now this doesn't, you can see the, the laser here, the line, and then this captures the three dimensional surface here. And very importantly, it doesn't damage the fossils in any way. These are very, very well protected sites. You can't collect the fossils. You can't even walk on the surface <laughs> wearing normal shoes. You have to wear protective um, neoprene boots instead. And so by passing the laser over the surface, you get this 3D surface um, with up to 14 micron resolution. But this takes quite a lot of time. So this is a time lapse video of an hour and we're scanning a, about a meter square. You can see the tripod here in the mechanical arm, and we pass it very slowly over the fossil surface. But it's worth all the time that it takes because the data set that I've created over these last years contains every deep sea community that's with more than 100 specimens on from this time period. So this combination of LIDAR to capture the large features and the, the micron level detail to capture um, the features enables um, me to, to, bring, to get digital data in the field and then bring it back to Cambridge and actually spend the time that's needed to analyzing it fully. So here are 10 of the surfaces that I've mapped up and analyzed so far. The gray areas represent the areas that have been mapped out. The colors correspond to different sorts of species. Uh, the, the size of the disc represents a specimen height into the bedding plane. And you can see there's a lot of different sorts of surfaces. We have some that are dominated by just one taxa, such as H14 here. Some are very, very diverse, like E surface. You have bed B in Chelmwood Forest that has a lot of very large specimens on, whereas other surfaces, such as Bristol Cove and Spaniard's Bay, only have very small specimens. So you have very, very high um, beta diversity, so that's diversity between different bedding planes. <laughs> 
Now, with, with these snapshots of Ediacaran life, what it means is that I can use quantitative ecological approaches that are normally only used in modern ecology um, and use them to investigate Ediacaran life. Now, of particular use has been spatial point process analysis. Now, this has been developed primarily in the forest, forest ecology. The idea behind these analyses is you mark up the points of where all the different specimens are with different uh, colours corresponding to different species. And then you leave behind a point map so that different uh, biological and ecological processes create different sorts of point maps. So, for example, uh, with these deep sea corals, they're very food or resource restricted, so they see a certain amount of space around them in order to survive. If two are too close together, then there isn't enough food for both of them and one of them dies, and this leads to the segregation or spacing out of points. So what does marking up look like in practice? So here we've got a modern uh, sea and enemy community uh, from over two kilometres deep. We can mark up where all the different sea and enemies are living. And if we take away the background, we have a point map. And so this is the sort of point maps that we deal with a lot in the Ediacaran. So what exactly does spatial point process analysis involved? So the first uh, thing to assess is whether the points are randomly distributed, aggregated or segregated. And this can be done in a few different ways, but what's particularly useful is using pair correlation functions or PCFs. The idea behind pair correlation functions is for every point, you work out the density um, of, of, of other points around, around each, each fossil specimen or point, and that corresponds the, uh, to the distance on the x-axis, the radius away from the points. The PCF uh, is the strength of um, density changes, so PCF equals one is perfectly random. If it's four, then it's four times uh, as dense as you'd expect by random. If uh, the grey area is a Monte Carlo simulation envelope, which helps, helps us to assess whether the observed data is actually significantly different to what we'd expect from random or from our other models. If it's greater than one, uh, then it's aggregated and below one is segregated. But the power of spatial analyses really kicks in when you start comparing different types of aggregation or segregation models, because these patterns correspond to different underlying biological and ecological processes. So tumulus clusters, for example, uh, where you have a cluster which is denser in the centre than towards the edge, these correspond to reprodu reproductive dispersal events. So rather like trees spreading seeds around the parent, this has a specific sort of pair correlation function. Another type of aggregation is the heterogeneous possum model, which is where you have random distributions on the underlying background or environment. So for example, if you're mapping out where trees are in the ocean, you only find them on islands and you don't find them on the sea. So this would produce your islands or your heterogeneous possum models. And what this means is that by comparing the observed data to different sorts of models, such as Thomas clusters and heterogeneous possum models, we can infer what the most likely underlying processes that contributes to the patterns of a seeing. And these relatively simple models can combine in, into more complex ones. So you can get double Thomas cluster models, which correspond to two dispersal limited reproductive events, or Thomas clusters on heterogeneous possum backgrounds, which correspond to reproductive events on a background environment. But the reason that these are quite so useful in the act Ediacaran is that the broad groups of spatial models can be classified broadly into biologically driven processes or environmentally driven processes. And this enables us to determine the most likely under, underlying drivers for these communities. So to illustrate this, I'm going to go uh, back to our sea and enemies and try to fit a random model to the data. Now here we've got, uh, we can see the PD value. So this is referred to as a uh, p-value in the forest literature, but it should be thought of more as an r-squared value, because if we have a um, PD value equal to zero, we have no model, uh, no observed, uh, the, the observed data does not fit the model at all, and if the PD value is equal to one, then there's a perfect model fit. So with modern spatial analyses, we can see what the underlying background environment is on the centimetre scale. We can't in the Ediacaran, so we can make approximations by doing density maps. So this, uh, and we can see for the sea anemones, this, this um, density map, which has come just from the sea anemones, does actually correspond to the underlying environment pretty well. 
So we can then test how well this environment fits the sea anemones. And we can see that it describes about 43% of the data. If we look instead at dispersal models, Thomas cluster models, we can see that's a little bit better. But when we combine them all together, we see we have a very strong model fit of 88% of the data can be described by reproductive events on a background environment. So now to address our Ediacaran questions. So how do we go about working out what Ediacaran organisms were? So for me, as a first step, I wanted to focus on the question of how they reproduced. So for this, I started with Fractifusis. Now, Fractifusis is a sessile benthic organism. It lives directly on the seafloor in very deep water. You only find it in Newfoundland, but where you find it, you find it in vast quantities. So I studied three different communities, each with over a thousand specimens on, the D, E and H14 surface. And I applied the spatial point process analysis. And what did I find? Well, on the D surface, we have a single Thomas cluster model that best fits the data. So this is a single reproductive event. On E surface, we have double cl Tom Thomas cluster models. So we can see we've got a peak of aggregation here and another one here. And it's the same on H14. We have a peak of aggregation and then the longer aggregation peak here. Now uh, we know that Thomas clusters indicate reproductive events. So what this suggests is that we've got multiple um, reproduction events happening on these surfaces. But we really want to test this. And so one way of doing that is to look at the different sizes. So we'd expect the small ones to cluster around the medium ones and the medium ones around the largest ones. And we'd expect them to have different sorts of spatial distributions depending on um, whether or not they were a result of reproduction or had come in in the water and um, colonizing from elsewhere. And what we find is these uh, size classes are very different. The largest fractifusis have a random distribution Medium ones, a single Thomas cluster. So that's a single reproductive event and large fractifusis are double Thomas clusters. And what's more, if we look at the patterns between the size classes, we find, well, we confirm that the, um, the, uh, the small ones go around the medium ones, the medium ones around the large ones. But what's causing this reproduction? So there are three ways that modern sessile benthic organisms like sponges and corals reproduce. They can reproduce using fragments or buds. They can re reproduce using uh, uh, releasing their gametes into the water. Or they can reproduce using uh, sterlon or runners, uh, rather like strawberry plants or spider plants. So I've mapped out over 7,000 fractifusis now, and the vast majority of them, you don't see any evidence of these buds or fragments. In fact, you often see little fractifusis under a centimeter long that look just like smaller um, versions of the big ones. So the question then becomes, what is the reproductive mode that's, um, that's creating these, these generations of fractifusis? So how do you choose between a waterborne approach and a stolon approach for reproduction? So the first thing I looked at was the directionality of the um, fractifusis specimens on the surfaces. The idea being, that if you have a current born, a reproductive event, it's far more likely to get specimens down current than to either side. And that would result in essentially elongated patterns. However, if you're reproducing via stolon, you're remaining connected to your parent. And so your clusters are gonna be more circular. If we look at the different size clusters, we can see vastly different results. So note that the, uh, the scales vary quite a lot here. The largest ones, we see very, very strong directionality. In fact, that the fractifus is four times more likely to be downstream of each other than they are either side. And this is not the case for the medium and small ones, where we only see a 20% change in density um, as you go around the different specimens. Furthermore, the size of the clusters that you get in fractifusis um, are so small that if you run some uh, seaweed-based propagule models, uh, you can't actually generate that tiny, very tight, um, small size clusters if you're releasing your propagules into the water. So what that means is we know that the majority of the specimens that formed on these surfaces were not the result of waterborne propagation, they were the result of stolon or runners. So what we think is happening is that you have a, a colonization event 
where fat diffusers are settling out of the water column, they're then reproducing via stolon, um, and then these are reproducing again. And in this way, we have uh, three generations of fat diffusers. So this was a paper that was published in 2015. And last year, some colleagues published a paper which actually found fossil evidence of stolon in five different Ediacaran taxa. So uh, it can be quite hard to see. Uh, we've got some uh, Ediacaran fronds here, here and here. But if we mark on on red, we can see these filaments or stolon here. And what's particularly compelling with these Randy morphs is we can see the stolon come in, attach to the holdfast disc, go to another one, and then off again. And so what's really, really wonderful for me is this is proof that the mathematical predictions are correct. We've gone in the field and we can find the fossil evidence of um, the stolon that was suggested by the statistical analysis. So for this study, um, I demonstrated how spatial analyses can resolve very complex dual mode reproductive traits and how actually the vast majority of fat diffusers were the result of stolons that's asexually um, produced, their little clones of their parents. And probably more, uh, most importantly, it demonstrated a new quantitative ecological approach for understanding Ediacaran life. So the next question that I want to discuss is why did life become large at this time? Before the Ediacaran, we have three billion years of microbial life. And then suddenly we get these large complicated forms in the fossil record. So, um, in order to address this, I started looking at what is the use of Ediacarans being large or tall. So, for about 20 years, it's been suggested that the increase in height is driven by competition for resources. And this competition leads to stratification or tiering. So, this is rather like a, um, a rainforest where you have a forest floor, you have a shrub layer, then an understory, a canopy, and emergent layer. And different species occupy different tiers or strata of the forest in order to avoid competing with each other for food and light. And the idea is that a similar thing was happening in the Ediacaran, and that stems evolved at this time in order so that species reach new tiers. Uh, and are free from competition. How do we go about detecting competition? So we, we know from the modern deep sea that they're highly competitive and we know that because they're very, very spaced out. So we can use uh, our spatial analysis and look for this sort of spacing out here and these ophiroids here that are very nicely, well they've moved, these aren't sessile, but they've moved in order to space each other um, out so they're not overlapping each other and they can all maximise how much food they get. So we talked a little bit about spatial point process analyses um, for individual populations. Um, and this extends very naturally into bivariate or pairwise patterns. Um, instead of looking at just the density from each uh, point or fossil specimen and increasing, you're looking, for example, at the blue ones and how the yellow ones increase relative to that um, and blue and vice versa. Um, and you interpret the pair correlation plots in the same way. Uh, PCF equals one means that the two species are random compared to each other. If, the, if it's greater than one, then it means they're aggregated compared to each other. And below one is the segregated or spaced out from each other. What's crucial when it comes to competition is determining whether the segregation we're seeing is due to habitat segregation or resource competition segregation. So habitat se segregation would occur when you've got the clustering together of, of points and they're segregated relatively to each other, not because they're interacting directly, but because the resources that they're relying on are in themselves segregated from each other. With resource competition, um, it's a bit different because you tend to get different uh, spatial behaviours at different sizes. Um, because competition is more likely to occur when you have large specimens because they need more resources. And this isn't what you see with habitat segregation. You don't get the same sort of size class um, based different patterns. So, for example, small and large trees both live on the same islands, but two large trees won't necessarily be next to each other in the forest because then they'll be competing with each other. For this um, set of analyses, I use three surfaces, the famous D&E surface and uh, another surface nearby called Lerm Staken Point. So, I looked at the interactions between and correlations between different taxa. Um, 
and so what what I found, um, and uh, well, so if we break down each non-random interaction or correlation, what we find is that, for example, with the fractal fusis and premed candelabrum, we have an aggregated segregated pattern. So this is something that we see um, with resource competition, and we also see with habitat segregation. But if we cut cut them down into size classes, we've got the little ones are just aggregated, and the large ones are segregated. And because we have this different size-based spatial patterns, we know we've got competition as opposed to a habitat segregation. But what's um, potentially surprising is that competition is actually quite limited in the Ediacara. We only have two instances of competition occurring on the E surface, one on low mistaken point and none on D. This is very unlike modern benefit communities. If you think of something like a coral reef, everything competes with everything else for space and for food and or light if you're um and so the question then becomes what is going on why is this so different and, um if all perhaps what's going on is that tearings happen uh if all populations are perfectly tiered then we'd only expect limited competition to be occurring so how do we go about quantifying the degree of tearing so here's a nice little model situation you've got three different taxa we have the relative heights on the x-axis and the frequencies on the y-axis. And so these are the height distributions of each of the three taxa. Now, in this scenario, you'd have a totally tiered, 100% um, tiered population because there isn't any overlap of any of the size distributions. But then if they're overlapping a little bit, you're having a reduction in the extent of tiering. Or you might end up with a very overlapping or very non-tiered community. So here are the three surfaces where we quantify the degree of tearing. So the x-axis is a different species, and the y-axis is the height above the bedding plane. The darker the shade of blue, the more specimens that occupy that height or that tier. So what we can see is that the D surface is very tiered. There aren't many specimens which overlap each other. However, this is not the case at all with the E, E surface, or the low mistaken point, where we see the vast majority of specimens don't occupy different tiers and are very overlapping. But is this because they're occupying different pairwise relationships? But actually, there isn't any correlation between the presence or strength of competition with tearing. So, for example, with fractifusis and um, feather dusters. Not all of these uh, species have been formally described yet. So we have some uh, names like feather dusters and ostrich feathers. But we can see here we've got uh, feather dusters and fractifusis. They do compete with each other, but they are very tiered. And in contrast, Beothucus and Bragatia don't compete with each other, but they aren't very tiered. So there isn't any consistent message coming out from this. So what's going on? So one approach to try and understand this is to look at the D surface and I'm trying to work out why it's different. It is very tiered with no competition, so we know it's different ecologically, but perhaps by understanding the community composition, we can work out what's going on with tiering and competition on other surfaces. So D is different in two ways. Firstly, it consists almost totally of rangimorphs here in blue compared to E in lower mistaken point. And secondly, it doesn't have many stem specimens which is given by red, and then the non-stems are blue. So to work out why D is different, we can look at the super diverse E surface and consider the relative tiering of the different specimens when we group them into two different groups, the rangiomorphs and non-rangiomorphs, and the stemmed and non-stemmed taxa. So we didn't find any significant differences between the rangiomorphs and non-rangiomorphs on the E surface, but there were significant differences between the stemmed and non-stemmed groups on, on this E surface but it wasn't what we were expecting. So remembering that we thought for a very long time that stems evolved to ensure species rich reached new tiers and avoided resource competition, we'd expect stemmed organisms to be very tiered in contrast to the non-stemmed ones, but we found the opposite, that uh, stemmed organisms were very overlapping and non-tiered, whereas the non-stemmed ones were highly tiered. So what this is telling us is that um, competition for resources wasn't driving height and um, uh, in these Ediacaran communities. But if stems and height don't avoid resource competition, what is their use? So the only uh, use or uh, advantage of height that we could detect on these surfaces was that the maximum front height correlates to the cluster size. 
And what this tells us is the taller you are, the further your offspring can go. And so the better you are at reproductive competition. So what, what um, we ascertained in this study is that the uh, resource competition is very limited within the ediacaran and height doesn't provide a refuge from this re uh, reprodu uh, from re resource competition. Morphological innovations such as stems are not driven by this competition and the only realised advantage of height was to maximise the offspring dispersal potential. So the final question that I'm going to be talking about is that um, what are the primary drivers for this early animal evolution in the Ediacaran? So one approach is to consider the relative importance of environment or niche processes uh, to, um, to neutral or biological processes. Another way to phrase this, which is very common in the ecological literature, is to look at the extent of niche versus ne neutral. Now uh, we can do this with spatial point process analyses because we can group the different models into neutral or biological models or um, niche on environmental models. So for this study, uh, we included seven different communities uh, with over um, 10,000 different specimens. So if you're an ecologist working in the modern, you may think this isn't very much, but uh, for this time period, it accounts for 86% of all species known at this time. So it is uh, a very comprehensive study of this time period. So here we have the, uh, the taxa pair correlation functions for the different surfaces. So the different colours correspond to the different species. And what we can see here is that the solid lines correspond to neutral models. So they're the result of random or Thomas clusters. Um, or the dashed lines are uh, niche models. So that's described by heterogeneous Poisson models. And we can see here superficially that very much that neutral models dominate. Another way to look at this would be like here. Um, very clearly you can see that the vast majority of communities are driven by neutral processes with very limited niche processes, ex exception being Spaniards Bay. Um, and we can see there's a um, uh, uh, the same the same species seem to be behaving the same way on different surfaces. Another way to look for niche, uh, uh, niche processes is to look at competition. And so we can expand out our, our bivariate or pairwise analyses and we can find it is indeed very limited. So there's only four instances that we've detected so far across eight different communities and 26 different taxa. What is perhaps most surprising is that we, we see the same sort of spatial distributions occurring across very large spatial and temporal scales. So bed uh, B in Charmwood Forest and E surface on mistaken point are separated with by potentially four million years and thousands of kilometers. And yet the spatial patterns for the Charnu discus are statistically the same. We see that with fractal fusus as well, in that the um, uh, separated by potentially millions of years and thousands of kilometers, we're seeing the same sort of spatial patterns occurring across different surfaces. So what this has found is that the uh, neutral processes dominated these, these early deep sea Ediacaran communities. And this corresponds to stochastic or probabilistic dynamics. You don't have a, a predictable deterministic response to the local environment. It's not, um, instead it's uh, much more up to chance. And what this suggests is that early animal diversification was driven by differences within the population rather than a systematic response to the, um, the local environment. So this is somewhat of a surprising result. And if we're trying to think about what the drivers were for animal e um, early animal evolution, we, we need to compare it to the present because we all know that the present is key to unlocking the past. We know that in living systems, they're very strongly influenced by their local environment. Most of the work done so far uh, using these spatial point process analysis is focused on forests, with very little being done on, until very recently, on animal communities. So if we want to uh, make direct comparisons, we need to work out what the best sort of Ediacaran system is to compare to the Ediacaran. And this is quite difficult. The Avalon assemblage is deep sea, and uh, suspension feeding dominated. Um, 
but uh, shallow water communities are dominated by encrusters such as corals, and they have much higher substrate co coverage, up to 85%, if not more. Whereas Ediacaran, you have around 10% for most of the surfaces studied. Densities are also very different, with Ediacaran densities of specimens being around uh, between 10 and 40, but sometimes going as, as, uh, as low as 8 and as high as 150 odd. The modern deep sea tends to be very much lower or very much higher. You get high density uh, uh, sponges and corals um, uh, around deep sea vents, for example, in much, much higher densities. But generally in the deep sea, you're looking at, on average, under one specimen of coral sponge per meter squared. But then in 2017, this wonderful deep sea community was found um, in the specific, uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. Now, it looks very superficially like the Ediacaran. It's relatively diverse and much denser than most of the deep water coral sponge communities. So it was named the Forest of the Weird by a scientist that found it because of these strange looking sponge here, which actually turned out to be a new genus. And so by analysing this, we might be able to get some more insight into the Ediacaran and how they might compare. Um, so from the video footage, we can reconstruct the community using photogrammetry. So that's multiple photographs of the uh, community from different angles. And this enables us to create a 3D digital construction from which we can map out the specimens. So here we've got a uh, 3D community, and then this is the side view, which you can see we've captured the 3D topo topography of the, of the um, substrate very well. So in this community, uh, we mapped out almost 600 specimens over 100 square meters. Now, surprisingly, the majority were dead. You can see them here, um, which are brown. Um, and uh, in terms of analyses done, uh, it turned out there were five abundant taxa that we could look at. So very comparable to the Ediacaran. So what was very surprising about the forest of weird is that there was a huge wide range of processes that we found. There were habits habitat associations between taxa. There was density dependent mortality um, of some of the sponges. There's a competition over both small and large spatial scales, as well as facilitation and a couple of dispersal limited processes. Another interesting thing we found is that the same community composition has different um, population and pairwise interactions across the surface. And that the key, key taxa and the tax interactions change depending on the density from biotic to abiotic. We can see here from this plot here that we've got a huge well, variety of different sorts of pair correlation functions. So if we go back to the Ediacaran, um, uh, actually before we go back, um, what, we, what we find um, is that even though this is only one deep sea community from the modern, it's hugely complex compared to what we're seeing in the Ediacaran. There's a huge wide range, range of different processes um, uh, and they change over a lot of different spatial scales in comparison to somewhere like the E-surface where we generally only have one or two processes that's dispersal um, and reproductive events. So we're still a little bit tricky to work out what exactly is going on. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, extend our temporal and spatial scales for our Ediacaran analysis. So far, we've been focusing very much on the oldest one, the Avron, but in order to understand how these systems evolve, we're going to expand out into the White Sea. So we've got these shallow water communities. Um, it's the main difference between them. So we've got this Kimberella surface here, which is very diverse from the White Sea in Russia. We have uh, surfaces from Australia, from the Urals, and from Katyspit in Siberia, which is the only deep sea from this time period. And we can see a, a large range of new sorts of organisms. So we've got Dickinsonia uh, from the Urals. And then on the Kimberella surface, we have uh, Dickinsonia as well, but we also have Kimberella and Tribrochidium, and we have about 12 different species. If we first take our sessile spatial distributions, what we find is a mixture of environmentally driven and dispersely um, driven surfaces. So Australian Phoenicia, 
uh, uh, have strong habitat associations, uh, the best model by a heterogeneous fossil model, whereas catty spit in Siberia, which is deep water, is still very much dispersal limited. So it's a bit harder when we start looking at mobile taxa because we don't have the, the large bank of different models that we have for sessile taxa. Um, so instead of describing their life history traits, we're, we're looking a little bit more at the behavioral ecology. So if we look at the Kimbrella surface, we can see if we take all the tax together and mix them up, we can't see any significant patterns. But this changes if we split them up into different groups. So we can see here um, that the Kimbrella is, which is a mobile organism, uh, is aggregated. But compared to the scratch marks it leaves while feeding, it's segregated. So what this suggests is that Kimbrella is able to detect where it's been and where it's fed and avoid them in the future. Uh, for the Dickinsonia surface, uh, what we found is that the small um, uh, Dickinsonia are aggregated, while the large ones um, are segregated. And this suggests that the small ones are trying to stay together, which um, organisms can do. Uh, they could be feeding or they could be trying to um, protect each other from large currents is a big problem for Dickinsonia. Um, whereas the large ones are less susceptible to these sorts of things, they, they tend to space out more looking for food. So what we find is very much a setting dependent behaviour. The deep water communities are dominated by neutral processes, where, whereas the um, shallow water communities are dominated by niche processes. Now, unfortunately, we've, we've only got the fossil sites that we've got, and there isn't enough um, uh, deep water sites that are young or, or shallow water sites that are old to really pull apart the difference, statistically at least, between um, how much of this is a temporal trend and how much is environmental. But we, we did propose um, that uh, um, there could be um, a, uh, I guess, a system of uh, diversification occurring in the Ediacaran that is consistent with the patterns that we found. So in the Ediacaran, we start with the Avalon, which is relatively low diversity, and we increase the diversity throughout the Ediacaran. And so if we start with the oldest assemblage, there's very little influence on the, uh, of the environment on the organisms and very little habitat heterogeneity. So prior to grazers and tritophores, the particulate organic carbon or particulate or organic matter flux would have been dominated very much by relatively homogeneous phytodetritus. But then in the white sea assemblage, we start getting mobile organisms and mobile organisms feeding um, on the substrate and grazing. Now, our analyses have shown that once grazing had occurred, organisms such as Kimbrella could avoid pre-grazing patches with selective grazing, accelerating further creation of mat heterogeneity and water column heterogeneity via differentiated um, part uh, particular organic carbon. Then this differentiated uh, POC and POM would have been transported to deeper settings by oceanic currents. The evolution of grazers would have therefore facilitated a shift towards size differentiated um, POC and POM, potentially increasing the heterogeneity of the deep sea habitat via water col column heterogenization. And we know in the modern that where you have more habitat heterogeneity, you have more diversity. And so what this means is that potentially there's a mechanism for deep marine diversification. So our results are particularly interesting when taken into account with the previous hypothesis of early animal evolution. So uh, Graham Budd and Soren Jensen introduced this savanna hypothesis to explain early animal diversification. It's called the savanna hypothesis because the idea is that humans developed hunting mechanisms to account for um, the uh, heterogeneity of the African savanna. So in the Ediacaran, the Savannah hypothesis suggests that early bilaterian diversification was driven by small scale vari variations in local habitat, primarily caused by the spatial distributions of sessile organisms. They then argue that it was a drive to find these heterogeneous distributed resources that led to, to novel evolutionary innovations such as mobility and eyes in a similar way to that early human evolution is thought to be driven for searching for resources. <clears throat> 
uh, our results demonstrate that at least some of these early animal communities that contain mobile organisms were indeed influenced by these habitat variations. And we've described a mechanism that links early animal diversification and benthic habitat patchiness prior to the evolution of predators and widespread pelagic organisms. So this adaptation of Kimbrella that we've seen to, to, to preferentially go to places that haven't already been engraved um, has the capacity to drive further diversification, initially dependent on the environmental setting, starting in shallow water, and then over time moving into deep water. Uh, while we can't statistically test it no, uh, based on what we uh, the known global fossil assemblages, uh, if this hypothesis is correct, we'd expect deep water assemblages to diversify during the terminal Ediacaran and into the Cambrian. Um, and that we have a, um, a chain of diversification starting in the Avalon um, uh, by promoting marine habitat heterogeneities. So in terms of drivers of early animal evolution, uh, we've shown that Ediacan community ecology is very much dependent on environmental setting and that the more diverse white sea assemblage has significant habitat associations and interactions. There does appear to be a correlation between uh, tax diversity and the relative importance of habitat. And there's this possible um, start of um, uh, feedback of increasing heterogeneity, leading to increased diversification as you approach the Cambrian. So to, to summarise uh, this talk uh, and the three main questions that I, I put forward for, for the Ediacaran, what are Ediacaran organisms? So one way to start approaching this very, very difficult problem is to look at how they reproduce. And I've demonstrated how we can resolve complex dual mould reproductive traits using these sorts of analyses. When we're trying to work out why life became large at this point, we can look at what the benefits of being large were for these communities. And it wasn't competition for resources. It was um, to maximise their offspring dispersal and their reproductive competition. And when we're thinking more generally about what the drivers were for an early animal evolution, we know that there's a stochastic or probabilistic start. But then as you go through time towards Cambrian, you get increasing environmental influence. So, all that's left is for me to thank my funding bodies and all the people that's helped me with, with this work and in the field. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was uh, lots of um, really good first principles of science in there, which I absolutely 100% approve of. Good stuff. Right, does anyone have any questions? We've got a few minutes. Not that I can certainly, I certainly have some, but anyone else first before I start chipping in? I think I'm, I had quite a lot of questions that you then oh. subsequently answered on the next slide. So I think that's <laughs> to a lot of other people. Peter. There we go. Sorry. So if we were to, if you were to apply the same analytical methods to modern environments, are there diagnostic features which would suggest that a modern environment was stressed or not very well in some way? So, and would you then be able to tell whether or not you're dealing with a, um, a happy, healthy, um, stable environment in the geological past or one that was somehow stressed or not very well? So um, there's, I guess, a competitive environment that's potentially food limited. Um, which you can detect very easily. The relative amount of stress is a bit harder to tie down. Um, but what's very interesting about the Ediacaran communities, at least, is they, they don't seem to be that concerned about levels of food. So they're not living in a stressful environment. Um, back in the 80s, I think someone coined uh, this idea of the Garden of Ediacra, in that everything's very peaceful and living very happily and not really kind of stressed by much at all. And uh, while that idea has very much gone out of fashion, because we know that there's actually lots of complex um, uh, interactions happening, and um, especially when you get into the White Sea, it was still very relatively unstressed. In terms of the modern, what uh, worked uh, is interesting to know, um, and what you could do is use these sorts of methods to see how the communities are changing. So repeated sampling, you could then start to see what's going on and how things are changing. And you can compare the different populations and the strength of the competition, for example, that you're seeing, or the strength of the habitat associations you're seeing, to watch how that changes over 
yeah, ecological timescales. Thanks. Well, I'm going to ask a question. So, I th as I think you touched on when you talked about your um, sort of forest of the weird example, hmm. is there potentially a time averaging problem with the way you're looking at these fossil surfaces? Um, if, for instance, they represent reasonably long periods of time, they, quite a lot of what you're seeing wasn't alive at the same time. Is that going to throw your ecological analyses out? Or are you sure that's not happening? So um, it, would, it, would throw, <laughs> it would throw them out, but we can be pretty sure that for most of the surfaces that that isn't happening. So when we think of time averaging in the fossil record, we often think of bones or shells building up because they, they uh, and, and but the buildup of shells and bones can occur over literally kind of tens of thousands of years. These were all soft bodied, uh, which means that uh, they won't have been preserved in that way. They um, uh, so you won't have the time averaging over geological time scales. in terms of more ecological time scales. So if you have uh, something that dies a day before it gets buried and preserved, that kind of doesn't matter <laughs> because essentially all the processes that were occurring just before it died hadn't happened. You can detect with some specimens, they're um, known as isohedimorphs or the very face. They, they, uh, and they're thought to be in the decaying remains and the carcasses of other organisms. And you can identify those uh, from their morphology. And actually, you, you can then see from the spatial patterns that they are mim mimicking the patterns of their kind of alive at time of death um, uh, organisms. You also, if you have a lot of time averaging, so if you had, for example, um, so that there are a few kind of more analytical ways we can address the problem of ecological time averaging. So if you had multiple communities, a build up and with the other one, you wouldn't expect there to be necessarily interactions between them. Or if you had the same kind of organism come down um, and so with the fractal fuses, for example, um, and you've got the large ones, the medium ones, the small ones, and it's not reproductive events, but they're different colonizations, you wouldn't expect them necessarily to be interacting with each other. But because we have non-random patterns that are consistent with essentially non-time average things, um, we'd, ex we'd expect them, uh, it's kind of reasonable to infer that that's what's going on. There are a couple of communities where you have, uh, you can see evidence of ecological time averaging um, in the form of very effaced fronds. Um, and what's quite fun about them is that most of these fossils, um, if they were upright in the water column, were preserved in one direction. And you have a couple of surfaces where you've got um, uh, fronds that are very effaced. So they're kind of, they, the preservation quality is quite bad and they're pointing in different directions. So it's very consistent with this idea that you've got, you do technically have two communities, but it's very easy to spot them. OK, good. So not a problem. This is yeah. <laughs> um, so my only other question was, so you're the stolen stolen based reproduction argument. Um, I absolutely understand why that's made and it seems reasonable. Do you have any idea how broadly that extends taxonomically? It's not it's probably not something we'd expect in stem group metazoans, as far as I'm aware. Ah. than the early metazoans that do this or maybe there are maybe some sponges well the so i was very very hopeful actually that when i when i realized or worked out that they're likely reproducing via stolon that it would somehow constrain their taxonomic infinity but basically most most invert well most sessile organisms can produce via stolon so sponges tinafores corals they can all do it and so it's quite hard to actually try to constrain it. So I would say that, yes, actually, you'd expect stem group metazoans to reproduce via stolon because um, <laughs> all the subsequent groups uh, do it too. That, that's encouraging. I'd never really looked at that. But yes, so it makes sense. If things like sponges do, then yes, mm. it would make sense if the stem groups do as well. Yeah. And you have a feeling for how broad the, how broad the within the um, diacons this extends to? So in terms of the um, kind of preserved evidence, there are five, five tacks away. You've got clear evidence of filaments. In terms of the spatial analyses, it's actually a study that I'm uh, hopefully submitting quite soon, uh, <laughs> looking more into details of the spatial analyses. And I would say that kind of 80% of the species studied have some evidence of um, kind of stoloniferous reproduction. So it is, it is quite widespread. Yes, in the Avalon at least, yeah. OK, thanks. Right, um, I've been talking for too long. Does anyone else have any questions? On silence. <laughs>
Well, I would love to be able to get hold of some of the 3D models you've got, actually. I don't know if they're publicly available. Um, any chance of getting hold of that Forest of the Weird model? Um, the basic problem with all the 3D model stuff is that they're very big <laughs> and it's hard to host them without yeah. spending lots of money. I have some of the Ediacaran scans, the smaller ones, on um, uh, yeah, on uh, Sketchfab. Uh, but the forest of the weird isn't on there. It's, it's no, just I'd love, I'd love to really use some of these in teaching, actually. So, cool. uh, but um, yeah, well, maybe I'll. Well, I'll have yeah, to I mean, so I have I have shared them, and people can then you can then print them out, <laughs> for example, and and look at them more closely. But yeah, we can chat more about okay, right, right. sharing them. You know. Right, this is definitely getting off topic. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So if no one else got any other questions, we've just about reached one o'clock. So. I just want to say thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. I mean, obviously, I'm a favorite dog, just so I would. But um, no, I, I, I really, I, I think the approach is really good, and it's good to see that um, we are slowly nibbling away at these difficult things, uh, <laughs> to work out exactly what they are and approach them from all sorts of interesting ways to to get real data on them. So thank you very much. Oh, no problem. Right. All very much appreciated, and yep. I'll I'll be in touch.